This morning, I have with me one of the most brilliant legal minds when it comes to understanding what's going on with the government, what's going on with Donald Trump, the lawfare against him. Uh, we're going to be going through some of the biggest stories in the news. I have Dr. Jonathan Turley. Professor, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Stephen. It's great to be with you. So let me give my audience some background, although I'm sure they've seen you uh, weighing in on all of the different Trump cases over on Fox News. But uh, Dr. Turley is a professor, attorney, legal scholar, writer, commentator, author, and legal analyst. And um, I, I wanted to jump right in. Many of my followers, and including myself, we, we find it infuriating that President Biden's top secret document scandal ended with no justice, no accountability, no uh, recommendation to do anything. Meanwhile, the, the Jack Smith case against former President Donald Trump continues to roll forward, although uh, Judge Cannon seems uh, irritated based on the release of redacted uh, uh, court filings and, and other things. Why would Trump's case not immediately have been dropped based on precedents with what happened with Mike Pence's documents, Bill Clinton's documents, and now Joe Biden's documents? Well, that's a very good question. The result out of the Her investigation did not make a lot of sense because Her's main justification for not recommending criminal charges was that the president was elderly. Uh, without a uh, firm memory or that his mental faculties had declined. And for that reason, he would be too sympathetic for a D.C. Uh, jury. Now, there's a, a, an obvious uh, and glaring conflict there because this happens to be the person who is also in charge of the uh, most powerful nation on Earth uh, with uh, decision making over such small details as nuclear war. And so if, if, you, if you are not viewed as capable of even being a criminal defendant, it's a rather chilling conclusion for her to reach. But you're right to point out the lack of consistency in the Department of Justice. One of their core guidelines is that they are pursuing like cases in similar manners. I always thought it was a mistake for Jack Smith to bring the classification uh, counts Quite frankly, his strongest count is obstruction. And if he had simply brought that, he could have gone to trial before the election. But Jack Smith has always had a tendency to follow Oscar Wilde's rule of temptation, that the only way to be rid of temptation is to yield to it. And Jack Smith has always gotten himself in trouble in that respect. He tends not to recognize limits he tends to go for the maximal positions of everything in court, and that has led him into trouble uh, with judges. But I do think that there is now this glaring conflict. One can have a good faith debate over the obstruction count and whether the president should have turned over material uh, when demanded. But those classification counts now stand in clear and obvious conflict with how other people have been handled in the criminal justice system. Yeah. Do you, do you think that that was, um, or do you think that there was instruction from above him to pursue more aggressively? Or do you think maybe he saw this as a chance to get Trump and make a name for himself? Well, you don't need instructions from above with Jack Smith. I mean, he has a reputation for going to maximal positions. Uh, and so I'm not assuming that he's getting directions from Garland. In fact, I've been critical of Garland because he has basically washed his hands of this matter. Smith has taken positions that, in my view, are inimical to free speech, that violate core Department of Justice policies. It's the attorney general's responsibility, even with special counsels, to say, you need to stay within your lane. You need to be consistent with our policies. I felt that Smith's position on the gag order has been really quite chilling. I mean, some of the gag orders he's requested uh, are, are in direct contradiction to existing rules and, and past positions of the Justice Department, and Garland hasn't done a thing. Yeah, let, let's stick with that theme because I wanted to better understand that. I, I see 
talking heads on the internet and, and on TV saying, uh, oh, these gag orders would have never happened if his name wasn't Trump. Um, is there is there truth to that? Or in high profile cases like this, is a gag order uh, common? I, I, again, I don't understand the law very well. <laughs> Yeah, the gag orders are common. I've been actually been a critic of them my entire career. I believe that they uh, often violate the First Amendment. What's different in this case was that the gag order, for example, in Manhattan, was not only excessive, but illogical. That is, the judge kept the gag order on Trump while Cohen, Michael Cohen, his former lawyer, was going nightly on TV, blasting him politically as well as talking about the case. And any reasonable judge would have said, this is foolish. Uh, you have a witness who's decided to enter the fray. This is not some bodega owner who's been pulled into a criminal case who doesn't want his name out there. Uh, this is a guy who's making literally millions attacking the defendant. Uh, at a minimum, he should have said, I'm not going to, to gag Trump in re responding to what is a political opponent. Uh, he also gagged him from talking about people like Cole Angelo, who came from the Department of Justice and was a paid political consultant of the DNC. Interesting. OK. Um, another thing that I wanted to understand uh, was I, I believe one of the contributing factors for President Biden becoming president was the cover up of the 2020 Hunter Biden laptop scandal. Um, not long ago, it was proven to be real, 100% uh, uncorrupted by the FBI. Could that evidence be used by a future Trump DOJ uh, to go after the 51 intelligence officers that knowingly lied to the American people? And could Joe Biden himself be held accountable uh, for knowingly lying during a presidential debate and saying that that was fake Russian disinformation when he knew for a fact it was not? Well, first of all, on background, when the laptop story first came out and was suppressed uh, because of that letter, I wrote, I wrote one of the early columns saying, this does not seem Russian disinformation because it seems to be authenticated by third parties. Much of this we already know, uh, but also third parties can cooperate them. And I said, it's strange that the media is just taking this letter and declaring this Russian disinformation without picking up the phone and just calling some of these other people who were on the other side of emails. If it's if it's fake, you would think they'd be all coming forward and going, oh my God, they just faked an email I, I sent to Hunter Biden. And so I've been writing about this uh, with people like Miranda Devine and others uh, since it broke. And I certainly have been rather critical of those uh, signatories to the letter. We know now that the letter was organized uh, by Blinken, now Secretary of State, and by uh, Clinton campaign associate, uh, Biden campaign associates. I, so the question is, what do you do about it? I've written columns that it's ironic for some of us who were on the receiving end of these attacks by saying that the laptop was real to watch many of the same media figures covering this trial where an FBI agent said, no, of course this is authentic, it's real, and there's no evidence of tampering. And there was sort of a shrug in the media, all these people that spent literally years uh, attacking those of us who were raising the laptop, uh, just sort of shrugged and said, oh yeah, it's, it's the laptop's genuine. Now, the reason I mention all of that is to try to give me some bona fides for what may be an unpopular position no, I don't think that there should be an effort to go against the signatories of the letter because I do believe that this touches on free speech, that you're allowed to be wrong. You're allowed to be a political hack. Uh, you're allowed a lot of breathing room. Uh, these were private citizens saying that they thought this was Russian dis disinformation. I must confess, I don't believe that some of them did. I think that this was a political hatchet job. I, but I would be very reluctant to have the government start to try to punish people, uh, particularly in a political year or during a campaign, for uh, saying things like this. I, I've said the same thing about efforts to try to criminalize Trump associates for what they've said, including what President Trump said on January uh, uh, 6th. I've, I've 
uh, maintained that his speech was entirely protected by the First Amendment. Okay, interesting. Yeah, my my feeling was, I'll bet you the majority of those 51 were like, oh, you're signing? I'll go ahead and sign off too. Yeah. Like nobody <laughs> nobody really researched it, but it, it is an, it's a lesson for all of us to be careful what you put your name on, if, if right. nothing else. Yeah. So um, in, in regards to the, the Trump hush money case, um, part of that was that this was legal fees somehow hidden to avoid the press, um, you know, talking about an alleged affair. Uh, Democrats are saying that this was election interference and that this is why the case is so big. However, uh, on the other side, you have Dan Bongino saying that the Hunter Biden laptop is proof uh, that the people in within the government, such as Antony Blinken, meddled in the election and that they should at least be investigated on whether that evidence was election interference. Is this just tit for tat and it goes back and forth over and over again? Or is it or is Dan Bongino correct in that there should be an investigation? Well, I'm always reluctant to unleash the government on moments like this because the accountability of President Biden over his use of the laptop denial is called an election. Uh, the House of Representatives has investigated aspects of this and will continue to do so. Uh, the hush money trial is something that most people are not familiar with as Americans. It was a political prosecution. Um, I think that there's no question about that. And even some legal analysts at CNN and, and elsewhere have thrown the flag down on this and said uh, they're really contorting the law to get Trump here. Uh, there's something deeply offensive about that for most Americans. It's in our DNA. It's not the first time. You know, as I talk about in my book, we've gone through these periods before. And at the beginning of the Republic, we had a president who did exactly what Joe Biden's doing now. In fact, one of the things I've said is that Joe Biden is slowly morphing into John Adams. Uh, you know, I consider Biden to be the most anti-free speech president since Adams. And we now see the prosecution of political opponents. Uh, Manhattan was a raw political prosecution. I don't care how people dress it up. It, it, they basically created this novel theory, uh, which I don't believe is constitutional in, in how the trial was handled. We'll have to see that play out uh, and leave it to the courts. Uh, but I don't think that investigating these cases will yield much. They do have prosecutorial discretion. They have all types of privileges, both in the state and federal system. Uh, if I was to have my druthers, uh, I would hope that Trump would stick with what he told Fox News, that his revenge will be success. Uh, at this point, I think Trump should take the high ground. And, and I know his inclination is to be a counterpuncher. So it's sort of hard. But I think that he needs to say, look, what was done to me is wrong. And my focus is going to make sure it's not done to anyone else. So, yeah, I'm going to pick an attorney general who's going to clean that department. And to some extent, there may be some investigations if there were things that were wrong. I'm not asking for investigations of everything that occurred that targeted me or my opponents. I'm going to use other measures to address that, including potential pardons. Uh, but I'd like to see him say, I intend to move on and focus on making the economy better and making the lives of most American citizens better while making sure our government gets into the business of governing. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. I, I know there's a part of uh, people that, you know, wants to see justice and there's another part that just wants life to become more affordable. They want, you know, their freedom of speech. They want to be able to live the, the life that they have nostalgia for. Um, but before Biden and his uh, unique style as president. Um, I know that you are a big believer in uh, freedom of speech. I wanted to understand from a legal perspective, when does that cross a line? For example, I, I can say anti-Semitic things. I could, you know, you know rage and say racial slurs, um, but society would put me in my place. Um, but but do they break the First Amendment? And, and the people that protested on college campuses 
over the Israel Gaza situation, uh, what was legal and and when did it cross a line? Because again, I, I believe that society will put you in your place if they think you've crossed a line, even if you're using your First Amendment freedom of speech. But when when does that cross a line? You know, it's funny because I've been called a free speech absolutist. Uh, there was a time when that was a compliment. I, but I'm a bit of a dinosaur now in academia. Uh, I do believe that the best solution to bad speech is good speech and that free speech is its own disinfectant. And uh, I also believe that history has shown that every effort to regulate or criminalize speech uh, has not succeeded. Uh, it has largely reduced free speech for others while not doing anything about bad ideas. Uh, so my natural default is, is to allow speech, particularly on campus, but there are limits. That's why I have to say I'm really not a free speech absolutist because there are limits. Uh, and we saw that on campuses, you know, right outside my office. I couldn't go to my office for weeks because uh, GW was occupied uh, and they shut down the law school where the, those tents were uh, uh, set up just outside our, our building. Uh, there's a difference between speech and conduct. And that's conduct. It's unlawful conduct. When you occupy buildings, when you occupy space, when you trespass, um, you're not being punished for your cause. It doesn't matter what your cause is. Uh, you're being punished because you're doing something unlawful. Uh, there are lawful ways to speak. I feel the same way, by the way, about cancel campaigns. I've said for years uh, that uh, people who interrupt speakers, who shout them down, are not engaging in free speech. There is this perverse idea that has been espoused by law professors and deans that shouting down speakers is a form of free speech. That's baloney. Of course it's not free speech. You're keeping others from speaking. You can protest outside an event as much as you want. But I've said for years that when students and faculty go into events and shut them down, they need to be expelled. They need to be fired because they're doing something that is inimical to the very essence of what higher education is all about. And, uh, you know, I, I once had, I once debated John Yu, uh, another law professor who was one of the authors of the torture memos that people often protest. And so John's often protested. Uh, we have a, 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 a disagreement about those memos and about some other things. So we were having a civil debate and the usual protesters of uh, you showed up uh, in Guantanamo Bay outfits to stop his speech. And this was at GW. When I walked out, I saw some of these students and they said, we want you to know it wasn't your speech. We we're just trying to stop John Yu. I'm sure you realize that. And I said, do you honestly think I support what you did? I mean, do you, do you honestly think that I believe you were engaged in legitimate free speech by trying to shut down Professor Yu? And they said, well, that is free speech. And I said, no, you are anti-free speech. You are everything that I've spent my life combating. You're trying to keep other people from hearing views that you don't like. So you're not part of the free speech movement. Whatever movement you're in, uh, you're part of a broader anti-free speech movement. But that has become the dominant strain of thought uh, on our college campuses. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That that actually was very clarifying. Okay. So when when speech morphs into conduct uh, and illegal conduct, you've crossed the line. But also trying to impose your free speech on someone else is actually trying to control their speech or their their inability to get a message out. That that's really actually interesting because I've uh, I've seen oh where. You know, Hillary Clinton is shouted down at Columbia or NYU. I've seen just recently um, Kamala Harris, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris was on Jimmy Kimmel. I've seen Dennis Prager shouted down and Ben Shapiro. And it's like, hey, I, I showed up to watch a message and now I can't even hear their freedom of speech because of, of the interruption. So, yeah, and faculty support this view. I had a debate with uh, NYU professor Walden, who's one of the big uh, sort of anti-free speech figures now. And he challenged me and said, are you denying that shouting down a speaker is free speech? And I was dumbfounded. I said, of course I'm denying that. Why would that ever be free speech? 
You're, you're keeping someone from speaking. You're in an event. You're violating the rules of the event. You're not letting other people hear opposing views. And in what universe would that be viewed as the exercise of free speech? Uh, but many faculty believe that. What is interesting is that with the Israeli-Palestinian protests, many liberal professors who have said nothing for 20 years as their colleagues have been fired and canceled and they have been utterly silent are suddenly being targeted by many of the same groups and they're being canceled and they're objecting this violates free speech. And of course, I support them in that, but I often note it would have been nice to hear from you uh, in the last 20 years as your colleagues were chased from pillar to post. Yeah. What's that saying? First, they came for my neighbor, then they came for my family, then they came for me. You know, if you say if you say nothing. Um, so you you have a, a new book out through Simon and Schuster, uh, The Indispensable Right, Free Speech in an Age of Rage. Why? Why did you write this and, and what are we going to learn by reading it? Well, I, I hope that people will take away something they didn't know before. Uh, because Stephen, I, I, when I wrote this book, I, it was the result of 30 years of writing in academic journals and publications and litigating on free speech. But I always resisted writing a book. Part of my problem was that I felt that free speech books often were incomplete. They often focused on little insular periods. Free speech, why free speech is at issue now. It seemed to me that what we needed was under, trying to understand why we're still grappling with free speech, why the Supreme Court seems to be in this fluid position constantly in determining whether something is protected or not with, with sweeping differences uh, from case to case uh, in, in the protection of free speech. And so I finally felt that I, was, I, I could write this book. And many people associate the term the age of rage with me, which I used years ago during the beginning of the Trump period. And when I said the age of rage, I didn't mean that it was the only one. This is certainly, I think, the most dangerous one, for, particularly for free speech. But we have had ages of rage since this country began. And one of the things that I do in this book is I try to go back and look at how we got where we are now and where we got lost on free speech. Because what we see is this cyclic pattern of what one uh, attorney general called panic politics, periods of anger and fear. And the first casualty inevitably in each of those periods is free speech. People immediately turn to limiting the free speech of others, arresting and criminalizing speech. So I look at each of these periods uh, starting from John, actually starting in Great Britain before the revolution and then going to our current time and one of the things that I conclude is that we have a sort of original sin in our republic when it comes to free speech. The most revolutionary part of the American Revolution was arguably free speech. Most people don't realize that the First Amendment was and still is an incredibly revolutionary uh, statement about free speech. To this day, law professors, there have been books written and there's a growing movement to rewrite the First Amendment because law professors say that it's dangerous and it allows too much free speech and it's too individualistic. So even today, uh, the First Amendment is viewed as radical. Imagine what it was like back in the 1700s, early 1800s. It was the greatest single statement of free speech in the history of the world. Of, that was adopted by any government. So the question then is what happened? Because when I went back and looked at some of the people who wrote on free speech leading up to the First Amendment and shortly afterwards, they all seemed to adopt a natural rights view of free speech. They, it didn't have to be religious. Um, it, it was a belief that free speech is essential to being human and that all humans have a right of free speech, not given to them by the government, but because they are human. And many believe that was a gift from God that allowed people to, to have freedom of thought and freedom of expression. So 
the fascinating thing was that that view was quite prevalent among many leading up to the First Amendment. Within 10 years, we turned against it. And it was largely because of Federalist judges who reasserted uh, or, re or, or embraced the Blackstonian, the British view of free speech. And this enabled John Adams to then try to imprison and potentially execute his political opponents. So the, what comes out of that is that this view, this Blackstonian view, is what I call a functionalist view of free speech. Now, what that means is simply that instead of viewing it as a natural right, instead of viewing it as something that we need as human beings to be fully human, it would started to be defended as for its function in helping democracy along, that we supported free speech because free speech makes for a better democracy. Now, that is certainly true. No one can argue against that. But if you think about it, it's a much more narrow rationale for free speech. It means that if speech is not viewed as positive or valuable or political, it gets less protection. So the functionalist view allowed the courts to continue to make trade-offs, to say that certain speech is not worthy of protection because it doesn't add anything. And that's the reason we have continued to struggle with this. As we go through periods of panic and we turn against free speech, we turn against people that we believe have what's called low value speech. Maybe it's racist. Maybe they're viewed as insurrectionists. Maybe they're viewed as seditionists. But they're all basically the same functionalist argument used by the British, that some speech is just more costly than it is valuable. So what this book does is it, it, it challenges us to look at the original view of free speech and ask whether we wouldn't be better off uh, with what was first envisioned by free speech in this new republic, that this is something that all of us have because we are human beings not because we're American citizens. And the government can't take it away from us because we need the ability to project part of ourselves in the world around us. Now, sometimes what we're projecting is racist or anti-Semitic, hateful. And obviously no one's suggesting that has great value, but it is value to the speaker and is value to the country as a whole to allow people to express themselves and allow others then to disagree with them. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things like agency, like everybody has agency, but your agency can create ripples that affect somebody else's life and agency. And, uh, but it is so valuable as I've, uh, covered international news. I see things up in Canada or England, for example, where they don't have the same speech laws that we do. And as an American, I'm like, wait, why can't you say that? Why are you compelled to speak a certain way and, and it doesn't make sense. Do you think um, when when freedom of speech was enshrined in, in our documents, do you think a lot of that was guided by the fact that many of these men had lived under a king or under a monarchy where they, they could have their speech compelled or controlled? Oh, I think that that's very true, Stephen. I think that even John Adams wrote I uh, passionately about free speech. And then he became one of the greatest hypocrites uh, in American history. He, he became uh, just thoroughly anti-free speech. And he, at the end of his life, he tried to justify it. But it was, even at the time, people were shocked. Jefferson Madison would write letters, sometimes in code. They were afraid that they would be arrested under the Alien and Sedition Acts. Um, Madison referred to sedition prosecutions as the monster that lurks within our system. And of all the framers, he was the most consistent and true uh, to his principles. He fought uh, speech prosecutions. Uh, he, was, he was the leading voice uh, saying that this is wrong. But you know what's fascinating about this history is I try in the book to tell our history in an unvarnished way. Um, in many ways, it's disturbing, but it's ours. I mean, it is our history. We remain the bastion of free speech, but we can't turn away from recognizing what we have done in the past. 
And that means that we have a strange set of heroes in this book. I, and I try to tell their stories because they're so instructive. I mean, our heroes are those people that, you know, George Bernard Shaw once said that unreasonable people believe that the world has to conform to them. And then he said, that's why all history is made by unreasonable people. Well, this is sort of a book about magnificently unreasonable people, uh, Americans that refuse to yield. And they are a strange mix. They're communists and fascists and writers and ministers. Uh, they're feminists, uh, libertines, uh, and then some very conservative uh, figures. But they all share this belief that they have a right to say what they believe. And what you come out of this is a certain degree of pride that we produce these people, not because you agree with them, right? You know, someone like Charlotte and Nina Whitney, you know, she was the defendant in one of the leading cases. And she was a communist. And I think she was wrong about so many things. Uh, but she was right about free speech. And she showed great courage. She was willing to go to jail uh, to speak her mind. And she was arrested for speaking against lynchings. And she knew she'd be arrested and she spoke anyway. Those are really our heroes. We don't necessarily have to agree with their views of, of politics to sort of embrace them for being courageous. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, I'm excited uh, for people to get this as uh, I looked through <laughs> it. Uh, I loved how it almost chronologically, you know, is building on this freedom of speech getting more and more layers, but as it does, it gets more and more complicated. And yet at the center of that is, is the importance of freedom of speech. And can we retain it and respect other people's uh, ideas? Uh, this is all part of the great American experiment. Um, I appreciate you coming on. I'm going to put a direct link down below so that people can pick that up. If people want to follow you online, where, where can I point them? Is, is Twitter the best spot? or? Yes, I have a Twitter, but I also have a blog, uh, which is jonathanturley.org. It's called the Race Ipsa blog, but it's jonathanturley.org. And uh, we discuss all these issues on that blog as well. Okay, great. I've, uh, I've read from it many times for my news broadcast. Uh, Professor, thank you so much for coming on, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for having me on.